Howdy folks! I have gotten some requests for tips on configuring the ray traced global illumination RTGI shader for reshade, an effect that I use fairly often in the custom profiles that I make for personal use. So I'm putting this out there to give a little insight into why I use the settings that I do and how to get a fairly subtle look from the, out of the shader. This is not a full guide to creating an RTGI reshade, and it does assume that you already have gotten the shader from Pascal Gilcher's Patreon, and the game that you want to use has a fully functioning reshade install, preferably with a basic profile already set up, so that you have a good starting point to build upon. Um, as you can see, I'll be using Red Dead Redemption 2 in Vulcan mode for this example, but all of this is generally applicable to any other Vulcan game or OpenGL games or DirectX 9, 10, 11, or 12, pretty much anything that works with Reshade and has stable depth buffer access. That part is obviously important if you're going to be casting rays about the scene, which we are going to be doing many of here. So yeah, okay, let's do this. So here we are with only the basic reshade setup, and the first thing that we're looking for is if we have enough performance overhead to enable ray tracing. This is why I recommend already having your other reshade effects sorted out, so that you know ahead of time how much GPU power is really left. So we can see to keep 60 frames per second, the GPU utilization is around 69%, nice, which is okay. It's about the maximum I would want. In my experience, that means we'll still be able to more or less keep 60 frames per second, uh, but having about 60 to 65 would be nicer. Uh, as long as it's below 80, we're okay. So I won't go over all my specific settings. Um, I kept mostly high everything. It's worth noting that keeping the same quality settings, I did have to drop from 4K down to 1440p to maintain 60 frames per second uh, to give an idea of the kind of performance hit, and obviously that's with DLSS already enabled. And obviously these uh, these considerations I'm talking about with the GPU usage percentages is based on VSync being enabled. If you're running with an uncapped frame rate, I uh, expect maybe a 25 to 50 percent performance hit in that case with maxed out GPU usage. Okay, well, so we got the juice, now it's time to turn up the heat. I like to create a separate preset for the global illumination, uh, just for the sake of kind of having the parallel presets for performance and visual comparison without having to turn off the RTGI effect individually. So we're going to go ahead and toggle the effect on here, and then immediately go down to the lighting channel once the effect is loaded so we can make sure that it's running. And here we can see the output of the shader. It is doing stuff there. We have some bright areas, we have some dark areas, we have stuff that looks like it matches up with the geometry of the scene. That's good. If we got to this part and we didn't see anything, like just like a blank gray screen or something. We might have to fiddle with the depth buffer settings, which is kind of out of the scope of this video. Uh, but that is this tab over here. It's labeled Vulcan. Since we're using Vulcan, it would be labeled uh, with the name of the other API that you're using if you're using OpenGL or DirectX. And there's some settings here to choose different depth buffers. Again, that's kind of out of the scope of this video. That's uh, sort of the whole thing. This is assuming that your death buffer is already set up. And we can see that ours is, and it's fully functional, um, which we can see by the fact that we have an output from the RTGI shader that seems to match the game. 
So the next step is going to be going through some of the custom settings for really like tuning the shader. And here we're going to switch over to the normal channel first uh, so I can demonstrate uh, one of the first settings that we're going to enable. And the normal channel is a map of all of the triangles in the scene and it's color coded in, in this case uh, to indicate the angle of the surface in relation to the, the viewer and this is important because it helps uh, reshade do the actual ray tracing by knowing the angles of the surfaces and then it can calculate the angle of the surfaces in relation to each other. Uh, so as you can see, we're using the smooth normal setting. With that off, it looks kind of not great, <laughs> as you can see. Now, the final output wouldn't be quite as horrifying as, as it suggests, because it's smoothed out a lot and blended with the, the source image, but as you can see, without the, the smooth normals option enabled, it's starting with kind of a chonky, triangly sort of thing there. And there, there was a bit of a performance there from using it, but I, I think it's fairly important to have that on, uh, as well as image-based lighting here, uh, which I already have on. I will go over a little later how image-based lighting actually affects the scene, um, but the short version of it is that it um, sort of takes into account more of the source image when deciding what should be bright and what should be dark, and it can help with uh, blending effects with the with, with uh, the reshade effect uh, blending that with in-game effects uh, the material type we're not going to touch uh, that's if you want to like, simulate glossy or matte surfaces uh, we're also not going to mess with sky color mode uh, it does have a an option to sort of simulate the sun even though it doesn't actually have any knowledge of the sun, um, unless the sun is directly in, in the view, it can sort of pretend that there's an outdoor light source, but in my experience, it doesn't work super great for games that have a combination of indoor and outdoor areas. So at this point, uh, it's time to actually go into the configuration a little bit deeper. switch back to the visual mode uh, and we can see it's definitely working it's not working well it's it's not tuned the best it could be <laughs> uh, let's just say that but it's definitely doing stuff the first thing we're gonna do is increase the range so there we go right away we can see that it's taking into account a lot more of the scene out to a greater distance. <clears throat> and in some games, you may want to keep this lower because it can kind of start to look cursed at longer distances where objects are in lower level of detail. But I find with newer versions of the shader, it's pretty good at blending and Oh, yeah, we can, so we can see here the next problem, and that's the strength of the effect is just way too high. <laughs> uh, let's see if we can get a look at the horse, too. Sometimes this horse, this particular horse, can look very cursed. Uh, I don't know if it's going to do it. It's okay. Yeah, we can definitely see on those barrels, though, that the effect is just blinding. <laughs> way too strong, but that's good. It means that it's working, and we can lower the intensity of it to make it a little more a little more subtle. So the first thing we want to do with the tuning is increase the bounce weight. And that's how the effect 
determines how much the luminosity and color value of the rays change as they hit each surface and sort of gain some of the color of that surface. And image-based lighting, again, we want to on. As you can see, when I turn that on, the ground on the snow get instantly gets way brighter because it's taking into account the fact that that's already bright to begin with. And now it's way too bright <laughs> because the uh, lighting intensity is uh, rather high. But we'll take care of that in a moment. So next we're going to change our ray length here. That's uh, the distance that the lighting engine allows the rays to bounce. And we want that to be fairly long for a game like this where there's large outdoor areas to get those like long, long ray bounces. And you can, you can see it at lower values, um, it just doesn't quite have the same effect where the light doesn't just doesn't seem to spread quite as much so i usually keep that around 16. um just tune that to to liking uh, extended ray length i i just kind of do that according to how i feel <laughs> but usually around 0.67 or 0 0.01 that makes the rays longer in the background uh, for really big light bounces Okay, so as you can see here, it's still still looking pretty bright, um, but specifically we're looking at those edges. Uh, around the edge of the barrel there's a little bit of shimmer, and we can decrease that by lowering the Z thickness, which is the thickness of the object that the shader is assuming, because the shader doesn't have full three-dimensional data for the object so it needs to be told how thick things are and if it thinks things are thicker than they actually are th then they can get those kind of halos and wow the horse is looking very cursed right now <laughs> um but we're gonna tune the amount of rays here before we go all the way in uh, as you can see lowering the amount of rays all the way down gives a little more flickering and then increasing the amount of rays gives less flickering there's always going to be some flickering in many games, though, if they're using any sort of temporal anti-aliasing, uh, TAA implementation, or uh, DLSS implementation, which requires TAA, because uh, for that type of anti-aliasing or upscaling, the source image is being shifted a very small amount by each frame to gain resolution. So it, end, um, it ends up kind of shaking when uh, Reshade is operating on that. But three, three rays is usually enough. Uh, and then the amount of steps per ray, as you can see, affects the clarity. So we want that fairly high to get as much detail as we can. I usually do around 13. Um, and uh, going, going back for a moment to the amount of rays setting, that is something that you'll have to have generally higher if you're running at lower resolution and then if you're running at a higher resolution you can get away with using fewer rays so for example if i was running at 1080p i might have to do five or six rays to get a, a good look and at 1440 three rays is fine and at 4k i like one or two rays uh, might be okay and then the simulation of back face lighting that i'm playing with here is an option that kind of gives the the lighting engine the ability to sort of intuit um, the depth of objects to a greater extent and uh, simulate light interacting with surfaces that are that are not visible so now uh, we're going to go ahead and save this poor horse from being terribly overexposed and adjust some of our settings now these are really something that you want to kind of do to taste per se and it depends on on it, your own preferences it depends on uh, the game it depends on a lot of things uh, but generally i find that you want to lower 
the stock values by quite a bit. The default values are nice just for seeing that it works because it's, it's, it's very obvious. <laughs> but I find, especially for a game like this, it's kind of cinematic, it's nice to lower those potentially by quite a bit. Uh, so if we're starting with bounce lighting intensity, we're going to decrease that by a lot not by too much. I find that usually around between 1 to 1 1.8 is nice, and that controls the intensity of light that's uh, bouncing around the scene and moving from a bright surface onto darker surfaces and brightening them up. And to me, that's, I mean, that's like the like the global in the global illumination well in the in the illuminate the global illumination in the global illumination is the important part here uh, it just adds such a nice effect if it's done right and the ambient inclusion is you know is something that can be done fairly well with traditional effects Obviously, that, that one's much easier because you're not actually simulating the movement of light in the scene. Well, I mean, in, in this case, it is simulating the movement of light in the scene, but you don't necessarily have to do that to get a decent effect, although this is just the the, the champagne of ambient occlusion because it's really doing the thing. It's it's essentially, as you can see by the, the, the dark areas, it's essentially adding shadows to the scene. Now, you can't cast very like long and wide shadows, but it can add local shadows. You can see inside the tree, under the, the roof of the building, <clears throat> inside the abandoned building. It's basically add, adding local shadowing to the scene. And you can see by the, the bright areas how it's adding local lighting too. And this, this section with the snow is actually a really good example uh, for the global illumination part specifically so we have the split screen here on the right global illumination on on the left global illumination off and you can see as i'm scrolling over how objects that have lower faces that are receiving light from the snow are actually receiving light from the snow as they, as, as they should and it's not other than the horse, which looks a little cursed, I will get into that later. Um, other than that, it's as you can see, it's pretty subtle with the way I have it tuned. And a lot of folks say that they can't see the difference between ray trace lighting and not ray trace lighting, and I, I believe them. You really have to look for it. Uh, so, for example, if you watch the side of this building as it pans over here, as well as the grass in the foreground, you can see that on the right with the uh, the ray trace shader, they're actually like receiving light that's being bounced off of the snow. So it's it, it's a subtle effect, but you know, it's, to me, as someone who's has a background in photography and cinematography and whatnot, it's something that I really notice. So the horse is yeah, the horse is kind of cursed. The thing is that that. The, the reshade lighting engine doesn't know that the horse is furry. It knows that the horse has a fairly dark brown coat, but it also knows that the horse thinks that the horse has some, some sort of specular highlight. Um, and it's treating it as if it were like a, a flat surface. So it's sort of acting more reflective than it would. This well, on the other hand, looks pretty nice. We've got some more indirect lighting going on here. Some more indirect lighting on the horse. Actually looking pretty good there. We've got some indirect lighting on Javier. Looking very nice, looking very nice. And performance is holding up pretty well. I did do quite a bit of performance tuning before this to try to get it the best I could. And as, as you can see, it's still not maintaining a totally steady 60 frames per second, which if you decide to use the shaders, kind of prepare for that to be the story of your life, honestly. <laughs> um, but uh, I'm going to do some befores and afters here. 
just keep a lookout for some of the details. It, it's not intentional, but when I enable the shader, it kind of flashes as the rays accumulate for the first time. So look for those flashing areas, and it'll kind of point out where the where the global illumination is happening. So make up your own mind, you know, how, how you think it looks, if you think the potential performance hit's worth it. You know, keep in mind that this is just my implementation of it too. It, it'd certainly be easy to use different settings and make the effect even more subtle. Or perhaps there's some combination of settings that I haven't found yet that would look even better. I'm, not, I'm sure that there is. And there's also other combinations of shaders that could be used alongside the global illumination shader to get various effects. I tend to favor using a fairly simple set in combination with, uh, with the RTGI, just so that um, I'm not going too overboard and potentially introducing performance issues since the RTGI shader is so heavy to begin with. So indoors here, uh, we're getting more of an example of the ambient occlusion than the global illumination, since there's not so much light bouncing around. As you can see, the, the highlights stay fairly bright. Um, if anything, the really bright highlights get a little bit brighter even. And then the midtones stay fairly similar, they maybe get a little bit darker, and then the shadows indoors get a lot darker. And that's something that I I personally like a lot about this shader. I think it, it adds realism, it adds immersion. It is a reason why I've seen ray trace lighting in general get critiqued a lot. You know, the whole, um, but it just makes things darker trope. Which, like, yeah, I, I mean, I've gone on this rant on my Twitch channel about how, yeah, ray trace lighting makes things darker a lot of the time, because a lot of the time, things in video games are too bright. That's my TED talk. Uh, and also sometimes things in games are not bright enough, which is where that indirect lighting comes in. Clomp, clomp, clomp. Arthur's stomping through the snow. I'm gonna do another indoor example here. Now, there are settings that can be changed to, to give a more dramatic kind of uh, light bounce with the indirect lighting indoors, but that can sometimes cause issues with uh, the outdoor lighting. So for a game like this where it's like a, a open world game with different types of day, uh, different <laughs> different times of day, and indoor and outdoor, and all of that. It's 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 really a fine balance to ensure that things look relatively good in different lighting scenarios. Okay, so it looks like some uh, Arthur and. John Marston are getting into it, which is, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's the story of the entire game. So we're going to go look at the lighting some more here and uh, wind down the video. Alrighty, and that concludes the vid. Thanks for watching. I hope that was helpful to some folks and maybe provide some assistance and insight into using the Raytrace Global Illumination Shader for reshade in a way that looks good, looks nice, looks cinematic. Uh, if you're curious about getting the shader, I'll provide a link to Pascal Gilcher's Patreon in the description. That's the official place to get the shader. You can get uh, up-to-date versions as they come out almost monthly via his um, 
the Discord once you're subscribed to the Patreon. Definitely worth it if you're interested in doing advanced reshade kind of work, because uh, when the shader, shader is deployed in a way that's that that really fits in the game, it can add that next level of photorealism for sure. So yeah, uh, that is it. Thanks again for watching. Uh, cheers. Adios.